Well, good morning, and we welcome you to worship today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We pray and hope that you had a wonderful Easter celebration. I want to say many thanks to all the people who participated in the 24-hour prayer. I heard a lot of great reports, and people said actually the hour they were praying seemed very short. Also, many thanks to everyone who participated in the Good Friday service, as well as the Easter Sunday service. We were blessed to be able to reach many people over the past weekend. I also want to just express my gratitude to all our staff who worked behind the scenes uh, for each service, setting up, cleaning up, and making sure that everything goes well. And without forgetting or taking him for granted, we continue to express our gratitude to Josh Cowing for his untiring service for the Lord uh, recording these services. We are looking forward to a time when we can gather here for worship together in person. We've set a date for April 25th, which is Sunday, two weeks from today. We hope that you can uh, be able to attend. Uh, for those who are still and needing more time, that's okay. We'll still be uh, producing this online, so you can either watch online or come and join us here on April 25th. If you do so, please notify the uh, front office so we make sure we know who is attending on that day. Today, we begin a new sermon series based on the Psalms. We are looking forward to learning much as we delve deeper into the book of Psalms. Our call to worship today reads, We rejoice and praise your holy name, O Lord, today, because you have kept us from destructive paths. We give thanks because your word gives us hope, and we reflect on your word at all times. You are the source of our deep-seated faith, and our spirits are refreshed in your presence. We are honored to be worshiping you, O Lord. Well, today, as we continue in worship, I now ask you to uh, listen together and be blessed as we listen to the piece entitled Festival March Praise, uh, brought to you by the Pasadena Tabernacle Band. May God bless us this morning. Thank you. 
Let us pray together. Lord, we come to you this morning and we are thankful that we can once again gather to praise and worship you. Lord, we are not in together in a physical building, but Lord, we are still worshiping you in our own homes. Lord, we thank you today that we are going to be listening to Captain's sermon on Psalms 1. Lord, you tell us in the Psalms that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And so, Lord, if we don't praise you and come to you, then we just need to look around in nature. And it's there, Lord, your glory, your majesty. Thank you for that. This week, we are mindful of the answered prayers. When we have prayed, you answer. And Lord, we thank you today that Alberto's uh, nephew, Gabriel, is showing progress. The doctors indicate there is no new growth and the tumor is actually a little smaller. Even though they thought there would be, his eyesight would be affected, the doctor is saying no, that is fine. And it's a real miracle. We thank you for Ruth DeGorio, who had back pain for so long, and she now reports that she is pain-free. Our friend and cadet, Kate, uh, is recovering from a broken ankle, but the cast has been removed and she now has a walking boot. She praises God and thanks him for answered prayer. Continue to pray for her. Georgia Law has a friend who had open heart surgery who we had prayed for, and now he is recovering too. Lord, there are so many things where we can look and see answered prayer, and we thank you for that. Lord, there are areas, of course, we still need help with, and we think particularly now for our country. Lord, we pray for peace in regards to all of the shootings and the unrest that is affecting our country. Lord, we ask for your comfort for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones because of these events. We pray for our core as far as the re-engagement is concerned. We pray, Lord, that you will be in all the details and that you will uh, be with us in that time. Lord, COVID-19 is utmost on our minds always. And this morning, we thank you that so many people are now being immunized. And we thank you for that. We uh, also pray that the procedures will go smoothly. We would also be mindful of those uh, studies that are now being conducted for children under the age of 16. And we pray that that will uh, be approved soon so that the rest of our children can be uh, vaccinated. We pray for all of the programs, the core uh, programs, the ARC, the TABS Men's and Women's House. We pray for all of those, Lord, that you will continue to be with them. We would especially pray for Captain Terry and Rotundo Masango. We love them, Lord, and we know that you are using them. So be with them and with the Fiela and Tanaka. We also bring to you, Lord, uh, Florence's friend, Esther, who is recovering, and we praise you for that. She is making progress, but it is slow, and we would ask that you would be with, and her husband also, Aziz, as he takes care of her. There are others that we bring to you, De uh, Deborah Gangi Morrow, Jim Graham, Marianne Bauer, and Rosangela Camerigus. We just ask that you would continue to be with them. Lord, you are a great God, and we praise you this morning. We thank you for your love for us and ask that you would continue to be with those that are listening to this message that is coming from Captain today that it will be used for your glory. We ask all of these things in and through your precious name. Amen. 
We continue with worship this morning, song 279 that was written by Fanny Crosby. And she said, to God be the glory, great things he has done, amen. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. And the chorus goes on to say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. So we'll sing the first and the third verse together. very important, wisdom. Wisdom is knowing the difference between what is right and what is wrong according to God. Wisdom is hearing and doing what God says. This reminds me of the game of life. You start your journey by choosing which path you will go down. Along the way, there are many life choices you must make. The game is full of strategy, choices, and chance. So is life, and when life presents you with a tough choice, it's good to know where we can go for instructions. God, our creator, is the source of all wisdom. We can go to God in prayer, seek the help of more mature Christians, and we can go to the Bible, the book that has a verse for everything. Some of you may be facing different choices, some harder than others. It doesn't matter how big or how hard your choice is, there is a verse for everything. Read the instructions and you will find the wisdom you seek. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am. 
Zachary talking to you uh, via Zoom. Uh, I was asked to speak a little bit about my experience during COVID. Um, overall, I, I count myself as pretty lucky. I, I never got it in the, in the people in my life uh, who did get it, which there weren't that many. Uh, they're doing well now, and so I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Um, at the time everyone, everything shut down last year, I admit I was I was I was very down, and I I know that um, a lot of people felt the same way. Uh, like a lot of people, I had things I was looking forward to during the year, and um, and of course they were canceled, but um, they were canceled for a good reason, and I learned to get used to it. Um, I quickly got used to kind of the new way of of living during the pandemic. Um, throughout the pandemic, I worked at Ralph's uh, first as a bagger, then as a cashier. Uh, and I've had this job for the past several years, and I thank God every day for it. Um, I'm so happy that I was able to work in a place that um, gave me a little bit of person-to-person -person interaction, even during COVID, just to keep my <laughs> just to keep my uh, my sanity, as you know, as I'm sure anyone can experience. Um, and I, I've uh, I really enjoyed working at the at Ralph's. Um, um, I, uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed uh, helping people and kind of doing my part to keep the uh, the food supply going. And so they say, uh, the, when the pandemic first started, it was um, it was uh, very difficult to work there. I admit there was a there was a staffing shortage. There were lines of people waiting to go, go inside, and there was nothing on the shelves. But overall, that that experience customer experience has improved. Um, so much, uh, and my experience of the company improved uh, greatly during the pandemic as well. Um, apart from work, it's been really nice to spend some more time with uh, immediate family during the quarantine, um, my nuclear family. Um, uh, I was very fortunate um, that they've all been, um, they've all stayed safe and they've been uh, employed throughout the pandemic, and I, I was very happy about that. And um, and I, because I know that a lot of people that that wasn't that wasn't true for them. Um, but overall, there have been some challenges this past year, um, as I'm sure there there have been for uh, many people. But um, there were also a lot of blessings, and um, and my time with my parents has been, you know, one of the blessings. And I thank God every day for both the challenges and the blessings. And um, I urge you all to to do so as well, and um, hopefully this we will hopefully we'll be able to meet again, and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone again when um, when we're able to uh, when we're able to safely. Uh, thank you very much, and um, I I hope you all are doing well. Thank you.
Good morning, church. Today I'll be reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 1, verses 1 through 6. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteousness. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. May the Lord bless this reading. Well, thank you, Pastor Dina Tebenako Songsters, uh, for that wonderful song. We are honored uh, to have recorded these songs over the past few years that have become such a source of great blessing during these difficult times. As we begin this series on Psalms, we are in Psalm chapter 1. Uh, it's a very short chapter, verses 1 to 6. Uh, this book, the book of Psalms in itself, uh, is is probably one of the most known books in the in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, and it's also one of the largest. It is 150 uh, psalms or poems. Uh, David, King David, wrote about 73 of the psalms. There are some that are very clear were written by him, and some were written by Asaph, who was the conductor of David's choir in the, in the temple. The theme of chapter one uh, that we're starting with is sort of different from the rest of the Psalms. Chapter one of Psalm, Psalms is a comparison between two lifestyles, uh, between the righteous and the unrighteous, the good and the bad, God's people versus the ungodly. It starts by, as we look at verse one here, uh, it starts by saying a blessed person or a blessed uh, human being is, is, who does this. I want to say before I go further that the word blessing or blessed is mentioned 108 times in the book of Psalms. So we might as well say just that the Psalms are about blessings or being blessed. Uh, Psalms is filled with this word. It is a foundation of the Psalms, the word blessed or blessing. So it starts by warning us. Uh, it starts in the negative and saying a blessed person is someone who does not do this. And there are three things listed here. Uh, walking and then stopping or standing as well as sitting in the presence of the wrong company. So it starts by saying that you are blessed if you do not walk or stand or sit in bed with bed company. We'll spend the next few moments here looking much more deeply into this. Let's look at walk. It says, blessed is a person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. What does it mean to walk? We all know that we expect a child as soon as they reach a certain age, whether it's eight months, nine months, or a year, or a little bit longer, to begin to walk. It is part of being a human being uh, is to be able to walk. Walking is an integral part of our lives. And when the Bible gives examples of walk, it's talking about a lifestyle. It's talking about your day-to-day -day living, your behavior as a human being. So here when it says, blessed is a person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, it means that blessed is a person who does not have ungodly principles. It's talking about how you think, talk, and behave must make sure that it's not influenced by people who are evil, people who are wicked, people who don't know God. So a walk can be your spiritual walk, can be your daily walk, meaning just how you conduct your life. And the first thing we learn here is that it's important to know that every day the way you live your behavior should be godly, should go alongside what God expects. So this message is essential for us as salvationists because we are people 
of holiness. We believe that we just are not saved and guaranteed for eternity, but we are saved and must daily live a life that is pleasing to God. So holiness is the walk. Your daily walk is your holy walk. It should be holy. But the writer here uh, then says that, blessed are you if you walk not in the counsel of the bad people. Counsel here is advice, opinion, or instruction given upon request or otherwise not even when requested. So counsel is the advice, which is someone's opinion or uh, whether it's re requested or not, is someone's perspective or philosophy of life. So the author is saying, blessed are you when you don't always live a life that is based on other people's opinions, on other people's assumptions or philosophies. The counsel or the philosophy or the, the, the way of living of others can be right or can be wrong. So here we are reading that it's important that our walk is not based on wickedness. Be sure that your advice, your counsel is not from a wicked place. Because if it's wicked, it means it's not heavenly, it's not godly, it's not spiritual. If it's wicked, it means that it's evil, it's not from God, but it's, it's not blessed by God, and it's not of God. It's a lifestyle uh, and suggestion and advice that is uh, human-centered, that is fleshly, and does not glorify God. It may make perfect sense in our present life. It may make uh, sense in the world, but it may, not, it may not be approved by God. In Romans 12, we read Paul saying, Do not be conformed to the standard of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your life. As I stated at the beginning, is that in the, uh, chapter 1 is a comparison of two kinds of lives. And I want to say on earth today, we live with two kinds of lives. There is the life of godliness and the life that is ungodly. The life of holiness and the life that is unholy. And the scripture here is asking us and encouraging us to make sure that our walk, our lifestyle, our behavior is holy, is godly, not the other way around. And, and Romans 12 then says, don't be conformed to the standard of this world, meaning that if we are not careful, we may be saved, but slowly are changed and conformed and shaped into the image of this world, which are things that are not godly. So as God's people, as Christians, I want to advise you this morning that the scripture is saying we must walk a life, we must live a life that does not conform to what is godly, but to what is spiritual. I want to ask you a few questions. Who or what is influencing you today? To whom do you run for advice? Are you letting the worldly thinking influence who you are? Rather, with whom are you walking? Who is influencing you? I have asked my daughter who's um, almost 20 and I've said, how do you live a holy life in college these days? How do you live a holy life these days? And she says, daddy, it's difficult. Because sometimes everybody surrounding her is living a life that is nothing to do with what we taught her growing up. And I want to say she's not the only one. Everyone listening to me today, including myself, we are influenced by the media. We are influenced by the, the, the news. We are influenced by uh, the social media. We are influenced by the things we read, by people we see. We have to make sure that when we receive information, it's not evil, but it's congruent with God's word. The next part of this verse says, who does not stand in the path of sinners? So you are seeing actually not a progression, but the opposite of that. We are seeing someone who is going backwards. You are walking with God, but then in this case, this person is walking with the wrong people, with the wicked, and then now stops in the path of sinners, and then later he sits down or she sits down 
with the wrong people. We are seeing a progression of, towards destruction and decadence than towards God. Blessed are you if you don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. The second part is, blessed are you if you don't stand in the path of sinners. So it means that there are two paths. There's a path that goes towards life and one that goes towards destruction. Jesus talked about it. He says this. Jesus says the way or the path that goes to destruction is wide and easy, and everyone is on it and just going there. But the path that leads to eternity, to eternal life with God, is narrow, is, is, is full of struggles and pers persecution and striving and difficulties, but that's the way that leads to life. Here the scripture is saying, blessed are you if you do not stand in the path of sinners. So you start with walking with those who are bad, who are wicked, and then you stop in the path of sinners. It's a warning to us that if you start entertaining the wrong things, not only will you walk with them, you will literally stop which means there is now no more development towards God, but you, you have stalled in your walk. You have ceased movement for God, but you are now in the very presence of the sinners. Sinners, let me define, sin itself is missing the mark, is not being who God has called you to be, is failing to rise to the standard of God. So sinners is, are any people who have decided that they will not follow God. They're living a lifestyle that is far from the standard of God. They miss the mark each day. Unfortunately, these days we have people who actually love to sin. They live in lives where they consistently are, are making wrong decisions, deciding to live a life that goes opposite from what God wants. So when you stand, it means you have stopped moving and you are standing right in the very presence of sinners. Now, I want, I, I want to give you a quick example. I have been visiting uh, relatives or friends for as long as I've been alive and I can remember. And sometimes you are visiting and you say, oh, we're going to be leaving now. You say your goodbyes and then you stand up, you start walking as if you were leaving. But at some point, the stories are so exciting, you then stop, and then you start talking, and then you get so involved and engrossed in the discussion that you end up just sitting down, and then an hour or two hours later, you're still where you were. Because what happens is you had some movement, but then you still enjoyed that company. You did not separate. You therefore stood, and then as you were standing, you said, oh, I might as well sit down. And by the time you sit down, you've totally resigned from your original goal of moving. So standing in the present, in, in, the, in the presence or in the way uh, or in the path of sinners means that you have actually now accepted that you are standing, you, you, you are no longer moving, you are enjoying the presence and the company of those, the Bible is saying, sinners. You see, sin should hurt us. Should, sin should cause us to be worried. When you do something that is against God's word, you should be worried. But when you stop being worried, when you stop being bothered by it, you may now be in a position where you're standing in the presence of sinners and you are congregating with them. You are in a place where God's presence is no longer there and you are purely enjoying the presence of those around you. If you are serious about walking with God, you won't stand in the, pre in the path of sinners because firstly, it's the wrong path, but you, are, you, you don't cease moving and enjoying that, their presence. It means, since there are two ways, there's a way that leads to destruction, but there's a way that le leads to life. If you are stopping in the way that leads to destruction, your life is in the wrong path and you're going to end the wrong way. So I want to encourage you today to do an evaluation. Ask yourself, what path are you on? With whom are you talking? Who surrounds you right now? There are some paths that Christians must 
totally avoid. There are some places Christians must never go to. There are some areas you should never find yourself in. Now, wait a minute. There are some people already who are saying, but my friend is not a Christian, but I, they need my presence, or they need, we need to preach to them and so forth. What I'm talking about is being in the presence of sinners to a point where they are influencing you, to be at a point where you are not influencing them or speaking to them, but you are enjoying their presence and you are slowly going towards destruction. So this is a message for you to be careful with whom you talk, with whom you hang out with. The third part is sit. Don't sit in the, in the presence of sin and, and scoffers. It says the word scoffer here means people who intentionally mock and deride God. People who intentionally scornfully speak against God. People who condemn God. People who are willing and ready to really denounce who God is and what he, he stands for. So this is the seat of scoffers. It means don't even take a seat down and have a cup of tea and have a dinner, have a meal with people you know intentionally want you to go against God. Again, hear me right. I'm not saying we must never go and minister to people who are lost. But what I'm talking about is a life and disposition where you are entirely engrossed in a lifestyle that has nothing to do with God, but may actually be intentionally speaking against God, doing things against God, a life of arrogance and foolishness, a life that is so involved in sin that it does not see anything wrong. One of my favorite scriptures is uh, 1 Corinthians 15.33, which says, Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. If you spend more time with bad company, the bad company will begin to corrode the goodness in you and to corrupt you to a point where you no longer see what is bad as being bad, but you begin to accept it as good. Your company determines your destiny. When I was growing up, I used to hear people say this. If you lie down with dogs, you're going to end up with fleas. You are the sum total of everyone you spend time with. If you are the smartest person in your circle of friendships, you are done growing. If you are the most spiritual person in your circle of friends, be careful that your friends may begin to influence you that, rather than you influencing them. Where you sit, make sure it's not the seat of scoffers. Make sure where you sit is not a place where God is not exalted. I don't know about you, but I have places and people that I, when I spend time with them, I never hear about God. I never hear anything encouraging about a spiritual walk. I never hear anything about building others up or spurring others on. What I hear is everything negative. What I hear is everything, how bad so-and-so is. What I hear is everything that is anti-God, anti-Christianity, anti-holiness. So I, I ask myself often, where should I spend most of my time? I should spend my time, my quality time, being fed by God, being influenced by the holiness of God, so that when I go out to preach, when I go out to influence people in, in, in the marketplace, in the community, I'm not being drawn by them, but I'm going to them to pull them out of it. So imagine if you were on a boat and there were people who were drowning. You go there to pull them out of the water into the boat, not to go in so that they pull you out of the boat into the water. So if somebody was standing on the banks is saying, be careful, there's too many people in the water who are going to overpower you and pull you out, you have to heed their warning and come back and scoop the water out and go back to save them and help them. As Christians, we need to have an anchor. We need to have a place where we come back to be fed, to be filled by the presence of God. Then we can go into the marketplace, we can go into the world, we can go to our jobs, to our friends, to our neighbors, and, and speak to them about the Lord and come back and be fed and go back out and influence them. What I'm saying is don't live just out there forever and ever and never come back to God. But also don't just live in the presence of God and never go out and influence others. 
a person who walks with God, a person of holiness, knows the balance. Be fed by God, but go out and minister. Don't just be ministering until a point where you run dry. We often say as preachers and pastors, we leak. Every time I share a message with you, I leak. Every time I'm in the world, I, I'm, I'm giving out God, godliness, and I need to come back and be fed by God some more. So my challenge to you today is, you need to be influencing others, but make sure that they are not influencing you where you keep moving away from God, standing in their presence and allowing them to devour you and overwhelm you. Bad wisdom leads to bad actions, which leads to bad company. So if you have people in your life, you know for sure they are lost. You need to pray for them. You need to pray for opportunities to minister to them. But you need to set boundaries. You need to be able to say, I'll go as far as this point. I'm not going to drink, smoke, take drugs, do whatever it is so that I can win you over. That's not how we win them over. We win them over by showing them we love them, but we stand on firm ground. We win them over by telling them Jesus loves them, yet we pull them to safety. We win them over not by hating them or degrading them. We win them over by loving them and proclaiming the gospel to them yet we still st stand in holiness. When we lose our holiness, we become ineffective in the community. When we submit ourselves to the devil, we cannot save people from the devil if we become part of them. We only are able to do so when we retain our holiness and our godliness so they can see the message we proclaim is different from the sin that's overpowering them. So my message to you this morning is, do not walk with the wrong people. Do not stand in the path of the wrong people, but don't even sit down at the table of the scoffers at the expense of your soul. You need to do evangelism, but come back and be fed by God and go back and minister to them. I'm going to stop there today because there's so much on this scripture that we need to come back to next week. We want to come back to talking about that people who are of holiness are devoted and are delighted in God's word and they produce fruit and they are watched over by God. So that's for next week. Today we're going to stop at the idea that people are lost. They need us to, to preach to them, but we must not allow them to overpower us. We must not allow the world to corrupt us. We must remain holy, pure, and pleasing to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for this message on the Psalms that we are just beginning to crack open. There's so much to learn from this book and there's so much to learn uh, from this scripture. So Father, I pray uh, during the week as we meditate on Psalm 1, may we learn so much and write notes and, and be able to apply what we are learning. For this message today, I pray in the name of Jesus that Father, we may question and evaluate our friendships. We may question and evaluate the people, the places, and the things that are around us. Are they gl glorifying to you? Are we involved in discussions? Are we involved in behaviors that are not pleasing to you? So in these moments, I ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you may forgive us, you may cleanse us, you may purify us, make us holy people. Father, so that when we proclaim your gospel, people may be willing to listen because they know we are set apart, we are different. There's something in us that is different, that is enticing to them, so they may want more of you. I want to pray, Father, for uh, opportunities to proclaim the gospel to the lost. I want to pray for opportunities to answer questions to people who ask uh, about the Lord, and we may be able to do that e either at, at a table where we are having a meal with our families or in a phone call or in an e email message. Father, may we shine the light of Christ wherever we go. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. So friends, we thank you for joining us today. We are grateful that you continue to tune in and be blessed as we participate in these worship services. 
Uh, just as a reminder, again, on the 25th, which is two weeks from now, we'll be opening for the first time to meet in this chapel. Uh, and if you are interested, please call our front office and we'll make sure your name is on the list. For everyone else, don't worry, we'll continue to live stream so you'll be able to catch us at the same time. May God bless you, have a wonderful week, and please continue to meditate on this scripture, Psalm chapter 1. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you. Let's conclude by singing the benediction together. <laughs>